Hello. We're going to be concluding the book of Daniel today. I hope it's been a good study for you. hope you've enjoyed the book. A lot of history, I know. A lot of debate about which interpreter is right. But there are some major truths through here. God is in control of history, friend. He's going to bring it about in His time and His way. And the wonderfulness of it, He's given us a little insight so that we can know when some of the things are going to happen. Boy, what an interesting book. And the interpretations have gone like a covey of quail. I know that. Most of them based on the interpreter's presuppositions about the historical setting of the chapters. Many of them focus it in the days of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, uh, the Maccabean period. Others focus it in on the uh, Ro Roman destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 under Titus. Many uh, project it out into a future end time with the Antichrist. And I think it's probably ambiguous enough to refer to all those and probably some intermediary persecutions because I think Daniel is much like the book of the Revelation, giving us information, but more than that, saying, My children, I'm in control of history. Fear not, little flock, that God has chosen to give you the kingdom. Man. Now, let's remember that the uh, literary section we were in began back in chapter 10. Chapter 10 was an introduction. Chapter 11 was the message. And chapter 12, really verses 1 through 4, should go with the message of chapter 11. And then 5 through the end is kind of an epilogue to sum everything up. Uh, and once you see that, I think it will be very helpful to you. Let's look at it. Now at that time. Now the Septuagint has now at that place. But time is the Masoretic text. That seems to be the, uh, what we're talking about. And it links it back to the concluding message, which from verse 36, remember last time, I think is the end time Antichrist. At that time, Michael. Now the word Michael means who is like God. There are only two angels mentioned by name in the Bible. Gabriel, the messenger angel of God, and Michael, the protector of the people of God. Okay, We see him very clearly in chapter 10, verses 13 and 21, and he's called an archangel in Jude 9, the only one that's called an archangel, uh, unless we possibly think that Lucifer, if we relate that to the evil one of Isaiah 14. Okay, So he is fighting on behalf of the people of God. Because it says, a great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, Calvin said it's the preexistent Christ who is the prince. But I think we're referring to an angel. Now it says, the sons of your people. Many have asserted this only refers to the Jews. And certainly in the context of Daniel, that all it can refer to. But because of Romans chapter 4, verse 16, where many of us have the faith of Abraham who don't have the racial seed of Abraham, I think it refers to the, the people of God. Matter of fact, in Matthew 24, 21 and 22, Jesus says it refers to the elect, which I would understand is the people of God, Old Testament and New. Now, in verse 1 it says, And there will be a time of distress such has never occurred. This is a direct quote uh, that Jesus makes in Matthew 24, 21 and 22, which seems to lock it in to end time events. Now, notice where it says, Since there was a nation until that time. Now, since there was a nation, the Septuagint says, The nation's written in a book. But Matthew 24, 21, Jesus changes the word nations to the word world. And that seems to be the idea. Some think it means back to the creation of human uh, society, maybe under Nimrod. Others say, no, it's back to the formation of the Jewish nation. But I think it's the ideal since the beginning of the world, since re uh, uh, recorded history, human society, uh, that kind of understanding. Now, then it says, uh, at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book of life. Now, I want to stop for a minute with everyone who is found written. For everyone seems to refer to those who are in the book of life. Now, there are two books in the Bible. We see in Revelation 20, 12 that the two books were open. One is the book of remembrances where both the godly and the ungodly are listed. The other is the book of life where only the godly are listed. And that seems to be the ideal here. Well, now, of course, God is updated to a computer. <laughs> of course, it's a metaphor for God's memory. Here, uh, uh, capturing a book, God knows those who are His. Kind of like John chapter 10. My sheep know my voice and follow after me, and God knows His sheep. Now, the idea here is, uh, I want to mention that this book of life is mentioned back in Daniel 7, verse 10. It's mentioned several other places in the Bible. Uh, Exodus 32, 32 and 33. Psalm 69, 28. Luke 10, 20. Philippians 4, 3. 
Revelation 3, 5, Revelation 17, 8, Revelation 20, verses 12 and 15. Now, the next little phrase, many. Many folks link the any, everyone, and the many. Now, many seems to, to imply that's used in verse 2 and in verse 10 that we're not talking about the general resurrection. But it seems we are talking about the general resurrection, but we would expect the word all. Now, verse 10 really helps us interpret verse 2. You say, Bible, if, it, if he meant all, why didn't he say all? Well, the Hebrew word rabbin, many, is used several times in the Old Testament in the sense of all. Let me give them to you. Be Deuteronomy 7, 1, Isaiah 52, 14 and 15, Isaiah 53, 11 and 12. There is also some New Testament uses where the term many really means all. You might want to see Matthew 20, 28, Matthew 26, 28, Romans uh, chapter 5, verses uh, 14 and 15 when compared to verse 12, and also John 5, 28 and 29, all seem to be where many is used for all. Now, sometimes all doesn't mean all in the New Testament. You might well see Romans 11, 26. Sometimes it goes the other direction, where the word all is mentioned, where it really means many. Kind of confusing. Isaiah 2, 2 and 3. Simply to say, the concept is fluid enough that this can refer to the general resurrection, though specifically it seems to a limited one. Some refer it to the partial uh, resurrection during tribulation period, but that's reading too much of our presuppositions into this text. Notice it says, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground. Now the word sleep is a biblical metaphor for death, but by the fact that it's sleep and they will awake, the biblical metaphor has the assume or the implicit idea of resurrection. You might want to see Jeremiah 51:39. And then Jesus' usage, one example would be John 11, 11. Now, in the dust of the ground. Literally, it's in the land of dust. Seems to go back to Genesis 3, 19, where God made us out of dust, and of dust we shall return. It's simply a bi biblical metaphor for the grave. Now, as it says, will awake these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. In Matthew 25, 46, the Greek term uh, eternal, Everlasting is used of both heaven and hell. If heaven's everlasting, God help us, so is hell. And here we see the distinction between those who know God and those who do not know God. And unfortunately, we like it or not, we must deal with that concept. Now, notice in verse 3 where it says, And those who have insight. Now, this word insight is used several times in the book of Daniel. I want to show you how it's used because it's used again a little later on. Uh, down in verse 10 of this very chapter. In chapter 12, verse 10, it shows us this is not referring to degrees of heaven or hell. But those who have insight mean those who are right with God, and, and the others refer to those who are lost. Now, from chapter 9, verses 13 and 25, we know it's those who have been given understanding by God of the truths of God. That's what having insight means. Not something we do. It's something that's done by God for us, and we simply are able to understand it and receive it. From chapter 11, verse 33, that this insight given by God is meant to be passed on to others or shared. So chapter 11, verse 33 is very parallel to chapter 12, uh, verse 3. Notice it says, And they will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. You might want well to see Matthew 13, 43 for a parallel. To those who lead many to righteousness. Again, you might want well to see Daniel eleven thirty three 33 for a real good parallel to that. Verse 4. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal them up in a book until the end time. Now, why conceal them? Well, that's what he was told back in chapter 8, verse 26, and it'll be told in, chapter, in verse 9 of chapter 12. That means that this was not for his day. He was to seal it up. Now, what does that mean? Well, seal it up in the sense that it wasn't for his day, seal it up in the sense of protecting it, and maybe the, the idea of making it secret from those who aren't gods who would like to know. Whatever it is, it's important for me to know that Daniel did not understand what he, was, what he saw. He's going to ask a specific question down here uh, in verse 8, but the angel will not answer him. In verse 13, he's going to be told to go his way and rest, not to worry about this anymore. I really think that some of the very difficult parts of the Bible are going to become very understandable to the last generation of believers. We may or may not be it, but right now, they're still pretty fuzzy 
as the many, many, many multitude of interpretations on eschatology certainly show. It helps me to know that Daniel, a godly man like him, didn't all understand the Bible. It helps me to know the apostles once said many times, we don't understand. Man, I like that because I don't understand. After I pray and do everything, I don't understand. It helps me to know that Daniel and the twelve didn't understand all uh, too. Now, then it says, um, until the end time, many will go back and forth. Now, this has been interpreted in two different ways. The word here simply means a rapid movement. Some, like Jerome and um, Theodore, Theodorshan um, and Loophole, one of my favorite commentators, sees this as the movements of the eye across the written page. So they would see it that the godly will search the scriptures and that's where their insight comes from. But others have said, no, it means rapid movement back and forth. Some even try to make it a, a rapid transportation like we have today. But that's totally misunderstanding the contextual flow of this passage. So it's either referring to believers studying diligently. Loophole translates this, uh, diligently peruse. Uh, while others seem to say it's referring to the, the godless people trying to find knowledge about God. Now, the last little phrase, and knowledge will increase. Now, some say secular knowledge will increase, but religious knowledge will not. Others say that God's people, because of books like Daniel, will know something of the flavor of the last days. And I'm really not sure which one of those diametrically opposite interpretations is true of this passage. You might want to see Amos chapter 8, verse 12, for the idea of secular knowledge uh, and people seeking God but can't find him. Now, verse 5 really begins the epilogue. 1 through 4 should go with chapter 12, I mean chapter 11. But 5 and following really deals with, with a kind of a, a new uh, concept and a closing to the book. Then I, Daniel, looked and behold, two others were standing, one on this river bank and one on the other. Now, if you remember this a literary context, going back to chapter 10 through 12, Back in chapter 10, verse 4, there were two angelic beings on either side of the Tigris River. This seems to be an allusion back to them. What's caused commentators some concern here is that the word for river is a different word. And the word used in this chapter 12 is a word that's usually used for the Nile River, not the, not the Tigris. But there is an exception to that. And that found in Isaiah 33:21. so we can't be too dogmatic. The literary context still seems to be the angelic figures around the, the Tigris River, okay? And they're going to ask one another. Now, verse 6, it says, And one said to the man dressed in linen. Now, the Masoretic text said, He said, implying one of the angels ask the other angels. But the Septuagint has, along, followed by the Vulgate, I said, meaning Daniel asked a question. But it seems the angels are talking to each other. Now, what is the inference of the angels asking questions about God's plan of redemption? Well, if you'll read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, the angels have always been curious about what God was going to do and simply did not have all the information they needed. But, and here they don't either. It seems that one of these angels, the one finally dressed above the river, is a higher uh, level of angelic being that knows the end time but does not fully reveal it. Now, notice if you would, here's the question of the angelic beings. How long will it be until, these, uh, until the end of these wonders? Well, that's the question of length again. Daniel's going to talk about that. It's hard to know exactly the period because of the ambiguity of the answer that fits many periods of persecution uh, history. I think it's ambiguous on purpose, uh, so it'll fulfill the needs of many eras of God's people persecuted. Now, notice where it says, and I heard, uh, by the way, I want to mention to you, there's a similar angelic question back in chapter 8, verse 13. You might want to notice that. Verse 7, and I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river, and he raised his right hand, and he raised his left toward heaven. When I first saw this, I thought it meant the man was praying. For the traditional Jewish posture of prayer is the hands and eyes lifted to God. That's how Jesus prayed. But here, it's a different gesture. This is the gesture of taking an oath in God's name. Now, we have many accounts where the phrase, I swear in God's name, is used. Uh, Judges 8.19 1 Samuel 14, 39, and verse 45. 1 Samuel 19, 6. 
1 Samuel 20, verses 3 and 21, and 1 Samuel 25, verses 26 and 34. We even see the word in verse 7, swore by him. So here are several examples of the gesture of taking an oath. I want to give you a few references of where this very gesture of raising one's hand to God is mentioned. It's first mentioned in Genesis 14.22, Exodus 6.8, a really good one is Deuteronomy 32.40, uh, Isaiah 62.8, Ezekiel 20, verse 5, and Revelation chapter 10, verse 4 and 5 mentions this symbol. Then it says, swear by him who lives forever. Now this phrase, live forever, in my opinion, is connected with the term Yahweh, the covenant name for God, from the Hebrew verb to be. We see it very clearly in Exodus 3, 14. I think it really means the ever-living, only living God. And when you swear by him who lives and only lives, you're making a very solemn oath. Now, notice where it says that it would be a time, times, and a half time. Now, this very, very phrase is found back in chapter 7, verse 25, in Aramaic. Here it's in Hebrew. Now, it seems to be, because of the context of chapter 7, verse 25, it's a period of persecution, and the whole chapter has dealt with the people of God under severe persecution. Now, this phrase, a time, a times, and a half time, if you look at the margin of your Bible, many put the word years out there. It's only an assumption because the text does not say years. But when you compare this phrase with the other usages of similar periods of time found in both Daniel and Revelation, it seems to accurately be three and a half years. Let me give you some of the other places it's used. In Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, it mentions, mentions 2,300 evenings and mornings. Now, of course, evening and morning is the way the Jews set up the time, going back to Genesis, that evening is the beginning of the day, so they start their day at 6 p.m. In the, in, the, in the evening. Now, that's been interpreted two ways. Some say if you divide that by two, it means 1,150 days. Others say if you take it as individual days, it means six years, 110 days. I think the uh, 1,150 is, is the better interpretation. Now then from Daniel 9:27, we have the same type of number used, three and a half years. Then from Daniel 12:11, which we're going to get to in this text, we have 1290, and Daniel 12:12 12, 12 has 1335. If we go to the book of the Revelation, in chapter 11:2 and 13:5, it mentions 42 months or 1260 days. Now, the fact that they're very close but not exact tells me that we're dealing with a symbolic number, half of the number of perfection, uh, three and a half being a half of seven. Now, whether that means human imperfection, the time of the Gentiles is going to be full, or if it's more of a literal three and a half years, I simply can't be certain. But because the specific days are different, I tend to think of it more in a symbolic nature. Notice where it mentions then, as soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people. I want you to know this obviously refers to a time of persecution where evil seems to be winning the day. You might well see Daniel 8.24 or Luke 21.24. And the question has always been, does it refer to the Jews or the church? Yes, I think it does. Now, notice in verse 8. By the way, I wanted to mention to you the Septuagint changes the meaning of this completely. Uh, but it's obviously uh, done because the Jews of uh, 250 B.C. did not understand the Messianic implications. Verse 8, As for me, I heard but could not understand. Now, possibly the angels understood and Daniel didn't. Or since the angels are still looking for information in First Peter, maybe they didn't understand either. I'm so glad Daniel didn't understand. He's going to ask another, uh, another question, and th the angel's going to say, None of your business, fella. That'd be good for somebody to tell us in areas of eschatology. None of your business. Get on with what you know. Get on with the good things about sharing the gospel and quit worrying so much about things that are totally in God's hand. Now, when it says, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? Notice the word Lord is in, has a little letters. It should be in your Bible. It's the Hebrew word Adon. It basically means sir or master. It's a t polite phrase here and it has nothing to do with deity whatsoever. Now, notice the angel won't answer him. He simply says, Go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end time. I really believe much of the Bible will fit exactly when the last generation comes and we understand completely the end time events.
Now, let's see if you would in verse 9. And he said, oh, excuse me, verse 10, many will be purged. The many of verse 2 we're talking about. See chapter 11, verse 35. Purified and refined. What is the purpose of persecution? The purification of the people of God. Listen to me again. What is the purpose of persecution? The purification of the people of God. In Hebrews 5, 8, it says that Jesus was perfected by the things that he suffered. Uh, in the, in uh, Romans chapter 5, it says that many of these trials build character in us. Uh, in 1 Peter 4, uh, 12, it says, Why does it surprise you when these fiery ordeals come upon you, as though some strange thing were happening to you? God uses adversity to build our character. He did it in the life of Jesus. He'll do it in the life of, uh, of the church. And here we have the same idea here. The persecution is not so the wicked will win, but the people of God will be what God wants them to be. Now, Thus it says, but those who have insight will understand. This seems to refer to the fact that those who know God will understand what's happening and have courage and faith. I think it's really important, that though we can't pick the exact date of end time events, the Bible clearly says that when the, the fig tree puts forth its leaves, you know the spring is coming. So I think we can know the general time and not the specific time. When many of these prophecies are coming to pass, it'll be obvious to many believers that even though the end time is going to be characterized by severe persecution and the seeming uh, victory of evil, that the little flock that carries God's name holy to the Lord is secure in the Father's hand. Now, verse 11. And from the time of the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there'll be 1,290 days. Well, the word uh, regular sacrifice is the Hebrew word continual and seems to refer to the morning and evening offering of lambs at the temple. Now, many understand this to refer to Antiochus Epiphanes offering a hog on the altar and setting up an altar to Zeus in the temple. Others seem to refer it to what Titus did by bringing the Roman standards and their gods into the temple in A.D. 70. Others say it refers to what the Antichrist will do at the end time. I simply do not know. In the context, it could refer to any one of these, maybe all of them. But it again shows the real problem that's going to occur at the end of the time. This little phrase, the abomination of desolation, has caused great problems. I think the phrase is used in three different ways in scriptures. You say, Bob, what do you mean? Well, I think, it's, I think the phrase is redefined and used in different accounts. Let me show you specifically what I mean. In chapter 8, verse 11 through 13, it obviously refers to Antiochus IV Epiphanes during the Maccabean period. But in Matthew 24, 15, Jesus obviously uses the phrase for the Roman armies surrounding Jerusalem in A.D. 70. However, it seems to also refer to the end-time activities of the Antichrist, the little horn of Daniel chapter 7. Uh, I think chapter 11, verses 36 and following is the end-time Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and much of the book of the Revelation deal with this end time Antichrist figure. So you say, well, which is, which is it? Uh, yes, it is. Then you'll notice uh, in verse 12 it says, How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains 1335 days. Well, it just mentioned 1290 days in the verse before. There have been so many historical attempts to fit these to 1290, you can't imagine. If you read commentators, they'll get so dogmatic on this is what it means, no question, and nothing really fits. It seems to me that verse 12 is saying, the faithful, even when what they thought predictive prophecy doesn't come true in the time they thought it should, they remain faithful and God blesses them. Now think what I'm saying. They were expecting 1290, but it went a little longer, 1335, and yet they kept the faith. They hung in there. They did not give up, even though their personal understanding of Scripture did not prove valid. Now, friends, that's a mark of faith. And they're going to be blessed because they hang in there. Maybe that's the difference of the number. I just don't know. The last verse of the book. But as for you, go your way. He said that twice. What are you saying, Daniel? You've got these messages. It's made you sick as a dog. I won't take. Daniel keeps throwing up every time God gives him a message. It just makes him sick. And after reading all this eschatology, I can understand why. <laughs> He's saying, look, Daniel, quit worrying about this, friend. This is not for your day. 
I think the reason he gave it to Daniel was Daniel wanted the people to be restored in Jerusalem in 70 years. God said, I'm going to do that, Daniel, but I want you to know they're going to be taken out of the land again. They're going to apostatize again. There'll be many of these periods of persecution. That's what he showed Daniel. But it's not for Daniel to worry about. Go your way, and you will enter rest. This seems to me to be an obvious allusion to death as a sleep, your rest. But look at this great truth. And rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the days. Friends, what a bright thing. Not only the resurrection mentioned back up here in verse 2, but resurrection is mentioned right here in the last. Daniel, go to sleep, friend. Go to sleep. Because God's going to wake you up and give you all that he promised one day. Wow. I want to tell you it's good for us to study eschatology. It's good for us to know end time events. It's good for us to see our world in its true light. That God's behind all historical events. That historical events are moving toward a purposed close. That Jesus will come again. The eastern skies will open up. We will reign with him. However, we don't know when. We don't know how. We just know God's in control. Maybe a good word advice in a day where we've almost gone bonkers on end time is, don't buy 500 books on, on end time. Buy you a few books on how to share your faith. Buy a few books on how to be a better disciple and follower of Christ. Live the hours you've got in loving, witnessing, and serving, and giving. Friends, God's going to work the rest all out. My wife and I sometimes joke, uh, she's a pan-millennial and I'm pro-millennial. She just thinks it'll all pan out in the end and I'm just for it. I don't know how God's going to do it. But he's going to do it. All history is in his hand. Even in the midst of persecution, the people of God are not forsaken. Michael tries to stand over and guard them, but they still get kicked in the teeth. But God's going to bring it to a close. All will stand before God and give an account for word and deed done in the body. I hope you know him. I've enjoyed being with you. God bless you. Have a good day.